Hello and welcome everyone to another session in Data Hour series. We are thrilled to be here with you this evening for a session full of action-packed learning. I am Lokesh Nagtode, part of data science team at Analytics Vidya. For those who have joined us for the first time, a brief introduction to Data Hour session. The Data Hour is a series of webinars conducted by Analytics Vidya and led by top industry experts. It is a fun way to understand <clears throat> the concepts of data science from the leading player in data tech domain. And as the name suggests, it's one hour dedicated to data. We are hopeful that these sessions are going to be great source of enrichment and value adding for community members. Now on to our session today, which is an, un an unsupervised ML approach using clustering. It's a technique where final goal is not defined and models have to find the hidden patterns and insight, insight from the given data itself. Clustering is an approach of unsupervised learning, which means grouping similar data together. The main aim of clustering is to identify the similarities in the data point and group similar data points together. In this data R, Pritesh will explain all about data science foundations focusing on an unsupervised machine learning approach using clustering. I hope you are excited to attend this data R with us. Before we kick things off, and I hand it over to our speaker, Pritesh, recap of housekeeping items. We are recording the session and the recordings will be available on our YouTube channel. The link you can find in the chat section. Please use Q&A section for asking any question you might have during the session. And we will do our best to answer them as the data progresses or towards the end. We will be sharing a feedback poll towards the end. You are all requested to kindly fill that up before leaving the session. Now on to our speaker. In this session of Data R, we have Pritesh Tiwari with us. Pritesh, founder of Data Science Wizard, is a chief data scientist and tech trainer with an experience of seven plus years in data science. He has completed his master's in data analytics from National College of Ireland in Dublin. He is associate faculty in National College of Ireland and his last engagement before starting up, he had set up and scaled up an AI and innovation team in multinational insurance company. Over to you, Ritesh, the virtual stage is yours. Hey, thank you so much, Lokesh. First of all, am I properly audible? You can just confirm or anybody from the participant can confirm me. Yeah, you are audible. Awesome, great. Thank you so much for the confirmation. So a uh, very good evening, all of you. I'm not sure what are the various locations uh, everybody is joining. I can see lots of good locations. Some are joining from Kenya, some from USA, majority from India, various part of the world. So first of all, I'm glad to connect with all of you and i'm happy to see so much data and to uh, like data science enthousi uh, enthusiasts who want to learn about machine learning who want to learn about clustering so always happy to see that okay before before i get started with the session i just want to keep it low and make you understand that i will try to keep it as soon as or or probably as low as or as simple as so that everybody can understand what exactly uh, you know we are talking about i can see that the people who are joining are from different backgrounds some of you are coming from good experience some are some of you are very beginners in data science so i will keep the speed low so that all of you can understand as well and in the meantime like uh, probably uh, this is for the panelists guys if you see any questions uh, from the audience. You can either interrupt me or you can let me know at the end. I'll be happy to take all the questions. Okay. Uh, I'll probably, yeah, thank you. I'll probably start sharing my screen. And once I share the screen, please let me know if that is available. It shows host disabled participant.
happy to see the like by the time he's enabling i can see that almost 55 percent people are joining from asia almost 14 percent from europe 13 percent from america i oh, sorry africa and then close to 20 percent from america even from the australia good people good number of people are joining from india as well and majority of you guys are of course students almost close to three to five years we have like 40 percent of the audience and we also have 15 plus percent of audience coming with eight plus years of experience that's good to have Pritish, uh sorry to interrupt you are you able to access uh screen sharing let me just check here yep if you can stop sharing i, I can start sharing this okay way. okay yeah Yeah, once you see my screen, can some of you can just confirm if my see, screen is visible. Hello. Uh, I'm not sure some of you are just seeing the data science screen, probably, uh, Lokesh, if you can confirm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I am. Give me a minute, just a minute. Yeah, Lokesh, probably you can stop sharing your screen and then probably others who are seeing your screen as well will be able to see. Some of them I can still see they are seeing the data hour series. Wait, I'll just stop and we'll share it again. Hello, Lokesh. Uh, I am unable to find that uh, stop sharing option. Okay, uh, so once you once you there is an option like share screen, click on click uh, click on that icon, okay. and there will be there will be an option to like stop sharing. Yeah. So I, I I can also see the option to stop your sharing. So I'm sharing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do that. I disabled. Okay. Fine. Now I can share my screen and I hope everybody can see my screen as well. Is it visible, guys? Can someone of you confirm? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Awesome. Great. Yep. So let's go ahead. As Lokesh has already said that today's topic is actually very interesting uh you know an unsupervised ml approach using clustering i'm sure you might have already heard about supervised learning unsupervised learning of course we will have a brief understanding about each of those before we get into the technicalities and the hands-on session i will give you a brief understanding about each of this topic but I hope after today's topic, you will have a very brief idea about what is unsupervised learning, what is clustering, what are the different types of clustering. And of course, you will be able to have the hands-on ex uh, like experience of creating one of the unsupervised machine learning model using one of the clustering approach. Let's go ahead. Yep, introduction to data science. So of course, like both supervised and unsupervised are the part of machine learning algorithm. Machine learning again comes under the data science. So before we, we get into data science, we will understand what is data science, why data science is important, and then why this machine learning algorithms are there, why we have different types of 
uh, different types of machine learning and what exactly where does this unsupervised approach fits in and what are the various use cases where it is fitting in and then we will also see the hands-on experience on that yeah introduction to data science so before we go into data science i will just you know tell you like we can go one step behind and see where exactly it started where exactly the word data science came from or even go back let's first understand what is data so data in a villa's very simpler terms it's just a information any information is data when you collect data together for some meaning work meaningful work that you are going to do in the future okay that is where you store data so that you can utilize it later on and when you apply certain technologies certain science which is your mathematics your statistics and everything just to make sure you are getting some inferences out of that data that is where you start using the word data science so where the first time it was used just for the information in 1996 probably uh, the first time the word data mining or data science was used like for example a lot of people everybody was using analytics before that as well even before today everybody was doing analytics and everybody was talking about in that era in 1990s that of course a lot can be done with the data but they were not able to do that everything was on paper okay but nobody was able to implement it the reason was they didn't had that that much complex technology and over the period of time in the very early 2000 when the advancement in technology came the power of statistics the power of data the power of computation came together and then they gave the birth to the term data science so the first paper in 1996 there was a paper called as an kdd you can uh, read about that paper i will share the link later on in that paper the first time the word data mining was coined from where the data science has came okay so introduction to data science what exactly data science is it's a branch of computer science again which involves the studying different types of data to solve business problems so when i talk about data data is coming from different different types of sources and data is of different different types okay there are many types of data and what exactly this process is about so when you try to find some meaningful important patterns from the data using certain techniques one of the technique is data mining then that process you can call as in data science or the data mining process like data science is actually more about data rather than the technology okay like of course data science is, is all about utilizing different different types of techniques artificial intelligence machine learning deep learning and all those things but of course the core remains the data if you don't have the data you cannot apply this tools and techniques and you know uh, technology so data science is more about the data okay and then of course applying different different kinds of an algorithms to make all those predictions and classifications basically in a very simpler terms it involves the storing of the data and then exploring that data manipulating transformation of that data and at the end analyzing the data using different tools and techniques and of course algorithms technologies to make sure that you are able to find some meaningful pattern out of that data yeah i will give you 10 seconds just 10 seconds just observe what is happening on this image okay yep so this image basically is provided by laurel lewis in his tweet in 2021 this data tells you what happens in 60 seconds what happens in one single minute so by the time we have started our session a lot of minutes has already gone but just take 60 seconds out of that and just imagine what is happening in that one minute or in that 60 seconds across the globe we can see we can see here that almost close to like 44 millions views have already came on Facebook. We can say that more than 2 million Snapchats have already been shared with each other. Like more than 197 million emails have been shared uh, across the globe. So this is the huge amount of data. The data that we are talking about, this is getting generated in one single minute. So just imagine in a day, in an hour, or in a week, or in a month, what is the amount of data as a human we are generating every day? So this data is, of course, impactful. This data is useful for the businesses, but you won't be able to utilize this data directly. In order to make use of data, 
you need to make use of it properly and with certain methods and techniques so that you can get the inferences out of it that is important for your business okay there are different different kind of businesses that requires different types of inferences some require real time inferences some requires reports charts some require certain kind of predictions as well based on which a very important decisions can be taken on that business. So in order to do all these things, you first need to store the data. Once you are storing such huge amount of data, you need to process them. You need to transform them. You need to, you, of course, data speaks a lot, but it's require the person, it requires the data scientist. It requires you who will be able to make that data speak with different, different kinds of technologies, techniques, algorithms, okay, that we will talk about. So you can see on your screen, this is the huge amount of data, guys, that we are generating every single minute. So we can see why exactly data science is important. So data science is important because of the first image that you saw, because we are generating such a enormous amount of data across the globe. Every single person, while they are using their phone while they're using their Facebook, their Instagram, their Twitter, the LinkedIn, or any other website, they are generating data in different types of format and in different sizes on the daily basis. Majority of the data is coming from your variable devices, different IoT devices, and are unstructured. It takes lots of efforts and time, of course, to make sure that this entire data is transformed properly so that it can be consumed for a king for giving any uh, inferences or for developing any machine learning models. Yep. Rise in amount of data is generated by digital world is increasing very rapidly. So as data science, as I said, uh, data science, of course, is the very umbrella word, or I would say the bigger word. It, it contains everything. And today's topic, why we are talking about the unstructured data, because the majority of the data that we as a humans are generating is not a structured data. In a, in a very simpler terms, you can imagine every data that you see in your Excel sheet in the form of rows and columns is in structured data. And any other data which is not in the form of rows and columns is either unstructured or semi-structured. Some examples of unstructured data is video. You cannot keep your videos into rows and columns, your images, your text, okay? The data coming from the various type of logs, all these data can't be uh, kept in the form of rows and columns. So they are unstructured data. And as a human, whether through machines, through personal data, or on the daily basis, whatever activities we are doing, the majority of the data that we are generating is unstructured. That is the reason, of course, it is important to create machine learning model to get the predictions out of structured data, but it is also very much important to cater the larger chunk of data that we are generating on the daily basis, which is unstructured. That is where the importance of data science comes in. That is where the importance of high computations, algorithms like artificial intelligence and machine learning comes in that can help you to process this data, to transform this data and give some inferences that can be impactful for the business. Just see this image, what exactly here is happening. This is a guy, this is a child and this guy is teaching this child. I will tell you the inference. Yep, so the child or the robot guessed it correctly. So what was happening that the person was telling the robot that, okay, this is a dinosaur. Again, there is another image. It will again, again tell it that, okay, this is also a dinosaur and then it will go away. Then the robot or this child will see one more image. Okay, and it has no idea what exactly it is all about. But based on the historical uh, information the person has given to that this child or this robot it is able to guess or it is able to predict that it is also a dinosaur okay so machine learning is all about prediction based on the historical decisions or the historical data in a simpler terms machine learning is basically providing the systems the ability to automatically learn and improve with its own experience without explicitly program what does it mean? It's like you are giving the ability to the systems, to the machines that they can learn on their own 
without you telling them what to learn and how to learn. You just give them the data and they will be able to create their own logic. So if you see here on the traditional programming, what used to happen in traditional programming is you used to have the data, you used to have the program. Program is nothing but uh, collections of rules and logics, okay? And then you feed that data, that rules and logic to the computer and the computer will give you output. For example, let's say that you want to uh, do the multiplication of two number and then you will give the data to the computer that the data is three comma two and the program is multiplication. Multiplication means do the multiplication of two number. So whenever you give this data, whenever you give this program to this computer, this computer will be able to give you three into two, which is six. It will be able to give you the output. So this is the traditional programming where you give the rules, you give the data and label and everything to the computer and computer will give you output. What happens in machine learning, you don't give the rules, you just give the data and you give the output as well. And machine learning algorithm will itself create its own rules and logic to identify if there is a data, if there is an output, why this output has came and how this output has came. It will create its own logic, its own rules, so that uh, certain correlations can be set between the data that you have given and between the output that has came out. Okay, so we will also see in detail about the different types of machine learning. First, let me just tell you in a very, uh, just give you the glimpse about what are the various steps in entire machine learning life cycle. I'm sure majority of you might have already heard about software development life cycle. Similarly, there is machine learning development life cycle as well. It starts with business need or domain understanding or the domain knowledge. For example, for any domain, if you're working as a data scientist or data analyst for any domain and you're working on any problem statement, you won't be able to interpret the data unless and until you understand the process of that business, unless and under, uh, until you understand the domain of that particular business. For example, if you're working for the banking, as a data scientist, you need to understand how banking operate, how the data, how the process in the banking operates so that you will be able to understand the data of the banking and you will be able to provide the inferences accordingly as well. So the first step is understand the business, understand the domain. The second part and the most important part is spending time with your data. Spend good amount of time with your data, understand the data and understand the problem statement that I am solving do I have the relevant data for that or not? Because now you are a data scientist. Now you are inside an organization, for example, inside a bank, and you are solving a particular problem statement. Now in this second step, in the data exploration step, you need to identify, do you have all sets of data which is required to solve this particular problem? If yes, that is great, go to step three. If no, then you need to identify how basically you are going to get all those data okay creating the data pipeline cleaning the data exploring the data transforming the data to make sure that you can feed it to the machine learning models third step is of course developing the machine learning model uh, like creating the machine learning model and your fourth step is basically third and fourth is a combination of both like developing and training your machine learning model the third step is basically you're making your uh, data ready so that machine learning models can be trained fourth step is actually training your machine learning model based on the data that you have got fifth step is of course once you have trained the model you need to check how well the model has been trained and you will test the model with different different kind of an evaluation metric like if you're working for regression, there are many regression evaluation metric. When you're working for uh, classification technique, there are many classification techniques as well. Okay, then you go ahead and you deploy the models. Once you are satisfied the model that has been built, you go and deploy the model. And then next step is once the model has been deployed, connecting that with the business need or the business application so that the inferences or the predictions can be given to the business. And the last and the very important step in this entire journey is monitoring and optimizing of the machine learning model. For example, once you have already deployed, your machine learning model is running in production. But what happens is over the period of time, the accuracy or the performance of the machine learning model starts going down. 
and it is very important to understand if it is going down why it is going down that is the reason it is very much important to monitor the machine learning model that you have created and then do the optimization required optimization in order to maintain the accuracy of your models okay let's go to next step Okay, what are the different types of machine learning? Again, you have supervised machine learning, you have unsupervised machine learning, and you have reinforcement learning. Supervised machine learning are usually defined as in task driven. Unsupervised machine learning is entirely data driven. You don't know what needs to be done. In supervised learning, it is task driven because, because you know your task. For example, if I am predicting the house price, I know what I am doing. If I am uh, doing the classification of a fraud or a non-fraud, I know what I am doing. So that is the task. So it becomes supervised. In unsupervised, you have no idea what you're doing. You just have the data. You need to find certain patterns in the data so that you can come up with certain analysis and inferences out of it. Last is reinforcements. Reinforcement learning is based on the reward and punishment mechanism it is it is learning from its own mistakes okay so we will three all uh, we, uh, like we will see all three types so the first one is supervised learning what happens in supervised learning remember as i said supervised learning you know what exactly problem statement you are solving you have your data first of all you have your required data as well that uh, the problem statement that you're solving for and you have the information about the data as well like you have the labels like for example if you are predicting apples over here you have the input data which is apple which is red in color and there is a green leaf and you have the labels as well like more information about this data like whenever the shape is red whenever you have a green leaf it is a label okay it is an apple so you have data you have information uh, you have the data and you have the information about it. Then you feed that data and information to the machine learning model. The model will learn it. So next time, whenever there is a similar image like this, it's feed it to this model. This model will be able to predict that, okay, it is an apple because it has been already trained on this kind of an input and this kind of an label. What happens in unsupervised machine learning is you don't have the task. You don't know what you are solving you don't have the information about the data. There is no label, there is no annotation. The only thing that you have is the input data itself. Like you have the apples, you have the oranges, and you have the bananas. All the data have been fed to the machine learning model. The machine learning model based on its own understanding, based on its own patterns, based on its own learning and logic, it is able to cluster them into different groups. Like whoever is red in color with the green leaves will go for apple. Whoever is orange in color with the leaves will go for the second cluster, which has all the oranges. Whoever with this shape and this yellow in color will go to the third cluster, which is banana. Okay. So the only difference between very simple difference between supervised and unsupervised is supervised. You know the task, you know the data, you have the data and you have the information about the data, which is your labels in unsupervised no information about the task, no information about the labels of the data. There is no annotations. There is no much more information. You just have the input data itself. Then you have your reinforcement learning. As I said, it is a mechanism of uh, reward and punishment. So we can, we can see one small example. There is a child that goes nearby to the fire and it feels warm. And whether it's a reward or punishment, it it is a reward that fire is a positive thing. Wherever again this child goes to the fire, but this time instead of going nearby to the fire, it is touching the fire and it is getting burned. So the learning over here is going to the fire is a positive thing, nearby to the fire is positive thing, but touching the fire is a negative thing. Okay, so fire, so the conclusion of the entire learning is fire is good if you maintain a required distance as it produces the warmth, but going too close, it may cause problems to you okay so reinforcement learning is based on the reward and basis at each step either it will get the punishment or it will get the reward so based on that it's further uh, like the current step based on the learning of the current step it will take the next step so that is the reason it is called reward and punishment basis so all the uh, automated cars which you see is largely Autonomous cars, I mean, is largely using the reinforcement learning behind them. All the games that you play, whenever you're playing against the computer, the largest part, 
the, the algorithm which is running behind is usually the reinforcement learning. Now we go towards, we will dive more here in the unsupervised part today. Okay, we have seen the supervised, we have seen unsupervised, we have seen what is uh, reinforcement learning as well. Today we will talk about unsupervised because as I said, this is the part which is generating the major chunk of data okay at the global level so it is very much important to understand what exactly part of this belongs to data science what exactly approach this is and what are the various algorithms available whenever you are dealing with such kind of an scenario okay so clustering as a name suggests in a very simpler terms i would say is a making of clusters okay clustering is a technique of making clusters of data types data types means organizing one data point or basically multiple data points into different groups okay groups are equals to cluster like one cluster is equals to one group they are used very interchangeably so that one cluster will have data points data that are very much similar to each other as compared to the other group so for example you will have group a and all the elements or all the data points in group a are very similar to each other then you have group b all the elements and all the data points in group B are very similar to each other. And data points from group A are not similar with the data points in group B. That is the reason based on that you have created the cluster. So applications, there are many applications on this. Okay, For example, in the retail industry, customers are segregated into different groups. Okay, Based on their demographic information, based on their spending habits, based on their requirement, based on their behavior analytics to fulfill various demands and, you know, giving the exciting offers. Like, for example, in any retail industry, they have the customer base from different age group, from different location, from different spending habits. Some of them might be spending every three months. Some of them might be spending every three days as well, right, depending upon the spending habit. So all these customers are basically segregated in different groups. And based on the each of the group, uh, these certain decisions has been taken either to send them some email to buy something or something like that. So this kind of decision are taken based on the groupings. So what are the various types of clustering? Okay, so there are, of course, different different types of clustering. But if we segregate them into, you know, two top overview clustering, there comes two. One is hard clustering. One of them is soft clustering. Hard clustering is basically assigning a data point to one of the cluster where it belongs so that the cluster can become, it's either it is is or or, like either it will be a fraud or a non-fraud, either it is female or male, either it is cat or dog. There cannot be any mixture of both, okay? The data point cannot be present or cannot have the resemblance with another cluster. It is very hard clustering. That one data point belonging to one cluster, they will always belong to that cluster itself. Okay, where is soft clustering? Uh, uh, le uh, like uh, k-means, which we are going to see today, k-means clustering is an example of hard clustering. Soft clustering on the contrary is like, it is not that much hard. Like, uh, like for example, one data point belonging to one cluster can also belong into another cluster as well. Here, if you see, this is one cluster, it has all its data point, another cluster, all its data point, third cluster, all its data point. There is no overlapping, but in soft clustering, there is an overlap. And uh, one example you can take of soft clustering, uh, maybe fuzzy, fuzzy clustering or the, or the fuzzy logic. Like for example, what happens in fuzzy logic is basically one data point is very much similar to another data point. For example, you can you can say uh, my name Pritesh, P R I T E S H or P R -E, e T E S H. This comes under the fuzzy logic where the meaning is still the same, but the pronunciation is different. So my the name I the letter I in my name can be belonging somewhere here. So this is also Pritesh. This is also Pritesh, but E, E or I is basically uh, the fuzzy logic, basically the fuzzy component that is making the difference. Okay. 
So yeah, different types of clustering. As I say, this is the overview. If we go more deep, what are the exact types of models? Here we are talking about the types of clustering, hard clustering, soft clustering. Here we are talking about the exact models. So what are the different models which is used for clustering? Okay. So there are certain models which is based on the distance between the data points in the data space. And whenever there is a low distance between the data point, they represent how similar they are. So just imagine uh, whenever there is a distance between data point A and data point 2, and whenever there is a low distance between them, it means that both are almost same. So this kind of model are always called as an connectivity models. Then you have a distribution model. I'm sure all of you know what is what distribution is. So there are different types of distribution, like normal distribution, Gaussian distribution, and, and, and various, various kinds of distribution. So works based on the distribution methods like normal or Gaussian. So in order to decide the cluster, you don't see the distance between them. You see the distribution that it follows, what kind of distribution it is following. And based on that, you keep them in a cluster. The third one is centroid based models which is the very famous model in clustering and that we are also going to see today work on an iterative model and find similarities between the data point based on the distance of data uh, and from and basically from the centroid of the clusters basically what it does is it creates different clusters and to each cluster it is giving one middle point that middle point is called as a centroid now it is checking the distance of each data point with that centroid and it is allocating the data point to that particular cluster okay so we will we will get it more clear once we get in deeper into it so this is called centroid based models then you have density based models where it is i would say a little bit closer to centroid model but how it works is like uh, it is more working on the density variation in the data sense. Like, for example, what does the density means? It's like how close the data points are. And when you check the variation between those density, you are able to see how, what, what, what exactly the density variation is there inside that data that you have plotted. And they either isolate the density regions and assign data points to those regions. Like, for example, it will uh, isolate certain highly density area, low density area, or low density data points, high density data points, and it will be able to create the clusters based on them. So they are very rarely used, but they are used as well, usually in the logs, where there are any, when they want to detect any anomaly detection, it is used very highly. Now domains, where exactly these clusters are getting used? So everywhere, I would say different, different domain, different, different industries, everybody in today's time is using clustering in some or the other way. Or, for example, I would say clustering or the unsupervised learning is the first step of supervised. When you don't know what exactly you want to do, but you have a lot of data, you start with unsupervised, you create the clustering, you see the patterns on the data, and based on the patterns of the data, you will be able to come up with certain uh, you know, use cases. And once you have the use cases, that means now you have the task. Once you have the task, you can create the labels as well using clustering. And now you have the task, you have the label. Now you can go for the supervised approach and create supervised machine learning algorithms. Okay. So different, different algorithms uh, are, are useful. And, but, but the technique remains the same, which is for unsupervised, which is the clustering. And it is used in different domains. The first one is retail marketing. Often clustering is performed to identify the group of product and the customer that are similar to each other. Like, for example, uh, like if, if there is a company, like for example, take name of Amazon, take name of eBay, Flipkart, they have thousands and thousands of products. They want to group those products into different clusters and again, group different customers who have the possibility of, of uh, buying one of the product in that group, right? So they basically create those clusters. So that is again the example of in, in retail uh, streaming services to find out the customer's content consumption behavior and clustering movies by nature. Now, if you open, I'm not sure how many of you are using Netflix, but it, it is a very classic example where I can give you about streaming services. The Netflix screen when I open or when you open or when someone else open, it is going to be different. It is not going to be the exactly same. 
why it is happening it is happening based on the consumption behavior the based on the content that i see is different as compared to the content that you are seeing in today's time okay and so all this consumption behavior behavioral analytics all this uh, what i say patterns in the customers are being grouped together and based on that uh, the customer clusters are created and the contents are shown basically the recommendation engines are running based on the clusters which have been created okay so one movie suggesting or one show suggesting to this cluster another show will suggest another movie or you know show to the another cluster so this is how they work to identify the similar consumer so that they can trail their emails into the customer or maximize this revenue so email marketing when they have thousands of customers or thousands of email to send how to decide which email to send to which you know customer so what what the best way to do is grouping them together and deciding that okay these are the 10 emails which will go to group a these are the 10 email which will go to the group b and making sure all the people in the group a are of similar type and all the people in group b are of similar type insurances insurance make a very good insurance company make very good use of uh, unsupervised learning or the clustering because they use it to make the cluster of consumer that is using their insurance policy in specific way for example if they want to know uh, what kind of insurance can be sold to what kind of people people are varying with their information some are between the age group of 18 to 24 living in a particular area and earning a particular uh, you know salary xyz they are grouping into them one cluster and selling them up a product or a policy of type a and then another cluster where there is a people with uh, age group between 25 to 35 living in a particular area or earning in a particular uh, uh, you know euros or dollars or rupees and they are belonging to x group uh, sorry group b and then they are trying to sell the product two or the policy type two to this particular group so basically depending upon the people the uh that are there in group they are deciding what kind of product or policy can be sold to them yep so today we're gonna see the k-means clustering the centroid based unsupervised learning approach for dealing with structured unstructured data whenever you want to apply clustering on any data set one of the very super like what i say one of the very favorite of data scientists or you know uh, if not even favorite like one of the widely used machine learning algorithm for unsupervised approach is k means clustering okay there are different different types of clustering of course like k means clustering hierarchical clustering and so on but today we will focus on k means clustering of course once you get the gist of one clustering applying and implementing the other becomes easy, but you will get the exact idea how it has done. K-means clustering is an example of centroid clustering. We just saw that, what does it mean? It defines the number of predefined clusters that it needs to be created in the process. It is also called very naive because you don't know how many clusters are going to be created at the end, but you need to basically give that number of clusters, which you can think uh can be there uh you know for example you need to predefine how many number of clusters needs to be created or can be created you give some number and the data will evolve machine learning algorithm will evolve itself and at the end it will give you the final number with the proper allocation of data points into each cluster okay k means cluster data points based on the nearest mean for example the centroid so uh, like what does this happen i will tell you in the next slide what is the aim aim is to minimize the distance between the data point and their corresponding uh, like in 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 that uh, corresponding clusters so there are five steps that needs to follow whenever you are working on any k means clustering the first one is to define the number of clusters that you are going to have okay it makes the group of that data point based on the specified clusters. Like for example, imagine you have a, a data plane where you have thousands of data points and you decide that these thousands of data points are going to be segregated into four groups or five groups. You just give the number on the fluke, of course, with some 
uh, sensible method or technique that we will also see what are the various techniques uh, which is being used. Uh, so you decide the number of clusters, that is the first step. And then it makes a group of those data points. Like for example, as soon as you have decided the number of clusters, the entire data points which is available on the plane will be allocated to certain groups. For example, out of that thousand, maybe uh, 200 belongs to one group, 350 belongs to group two, another 300 group uh, data points belong to group C, and then 50 belongs to group four, and maybe the remaining 100 or 150 belongs to group five, something like that. So once you define the number of clusters, it will allocate the data points to it. The third step is the algorithm computes the cluster centroid. Now, this is very interesting. What it does is it computes the uh, cluster centroid. It decides that you have created five groups. What is the centroid or the center value? The center value of that group becomes the centroid. Okay. And then it reassigns the data points to the closest centroid. You imagine there are five clusters now. Each cluster has a centroid, which is a center point. And all these data points are basically uh, reassigned to each cluster or each group based on the distance between uh, their centroid, okay? And then you have the fifth step is algorithm again computes the centroid for each cluster. So every time some numbers are allocated to each group or each cluster, the reallocation of the centroid happens, the recomputation of the centroid happens and each time the clusters are created the redefinition of uh, that centroid happens and again the distance between all the data points and that centroid is calculated and whichever data points is nearest to their corresponding centroid they are allocated to the group and you will repeat the steps of three four five again and again and again till the time you have properly segregated send, uh, clusters like cluster A, cluster B, cluster C, cluster D and cluster E. And there is no further refinement and there is no further allocation of the data point from one cluster to another cluster. So at the final, what will happen that all the data point have the minimum distance with their centroid and all the centroid has the maximum distance between each other. Like centroid A will have the maximum distance with centroid B, centroid B will have the maximum distance with centroid A and C, and centroid C will have the maximum distance between A, B, and D and E, and, and it goes on. That is one, and second is uh, all the data points within one cluster will be very close to each other, first of all, and they will be very close to their centroid as well. That is called the similarity within the group and checking the distance, uh, the dissimilarity, or, or, or probably you can see the, the distance between the two centroids or the two groups. Okay. Let's go ahead. So finding the optimum number of clusters, as I said, it is very naive method. You need to give the number of clusters which will be there at the very beginning itself. So how do you do that? Okay, so there are multiple methods to do that. One of the method is elbow method. Another method is still out analysis based on which you decide how many number of clusters can be created. We will see both the techniques today on multiple, uh, on, on different, different types of techniques. So you can understand how it has been done. It performs k-means clustering for given different values of k and calculate the average distance between the data points. Okay, and uh, on the uh, Silhout distance, it finds the coefficient basically to compute the similarity of the data point with other data point within the cluster. So one is dealing with the similarity, another one is dealing with the distance. So this is how the elbow looks like. So you have the fall of all the clusters. Whenever this is, there is something like this, like your elbow, that becomes your optimized number of clusters that you define and you feed your model with. And uh, you also check Silhout analysis like this, where you are checking the average 
सिल हाउट कोफिशियंट्स एंड चूज द हाइएस्ट पॉइंट ऑन द प्लॉट एज द ऑप्टिमल नंबर ऑफ क्लस्टर सो वेन एवर यू वट एवर नंबर ऑफ क्लस्टर यू सी एज द हाइएस्ट हियर इट इज थ्री हियर एल्बो मेथड शोज थ्री सो दैट मीन्स यू विल चूज एज थ्री एज योर ऑप्टिमाइज नंबर ओके सो टॉकिंग अबाउट टूडेज डेटा सो टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डू द कस्टमर सेगमेंटेशन यूजिंग द के मीन्स क्लस्टरिंग on the given data set of the mall customer segmentation okay so it's a, it is a data set of the mall and and they want to run certain campaign to send uh, you know some uh, promotional email to their customer and before that they want to segment their customers into different clusters okay this mall on the every mall on the daily basis gets lots of customers coming from different age group different location different spending habit and so on they will be doing the segmentation of this customers okay now you have customer id as a data point you have gender you have age you have annual income and spending score what we are going to do is implement k means clustering to perform customer segmentation using the given step first step we will going to import all the data in libraries second step we will do is data validation third step we are going to create two dimensional k means clustering between age and annual income we will see the correlation in age and annual income by creating the clusters based on that then we will create the k means clustering based on the age and spending habit okay it's again the two dimensional one then we will again create two dimensional clustering based on the uh, spending score and the annual income and then finally we will create the 3d uh, k means clustering between the age spending score and the annual income itself okay so let's go ahead yeah of course just talking about in a very nutshell about what is the vision and mission of today's uh, algorithm that we are going to implement or of the today's use cases the vision is we are going to utilize the clustering analysis to give more compact data analytics about the customer behavior based on the given different different types of information about the data the demographic information about the customers like their age their gender and their spending nature as well okay and the mission is to make this data accurately segmented or the properly the clusters created based on the age income and spending behavior Yep, let's see the hands-on session using the K-means clustering. And thank you. I'll start the hands-on session immediately. Let me stop sharing and share the other screen. Any questions in the meantime? Pratesh, there are a lot of questions for you already. Uh, would you like to answer them right away or uh, prefer I can... them at the end of uh, I think I think I will take it at the end. I need to spend some time for the hands-on session as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great to see uh, so much participation from all of you. Feel free to ask any question. Every question is good and is beneficial for everybody. I will take all the questions. Don't worry. Oops. I'm started again. The same. Just give me one second. Yeah, so today's session, hands-on session, uh, I am going to take on Collab. I'm sure majority of you might be knowing about Google Collab. If you don't know, don't worry. I will just tell you what exactly it's about. So Google Collab is a runtime environment provided by the Google where you can utilize the computational power of Google itself. First of all, just confirm me if you can see my screen, guys. Anybody in the chat or probably someone from the panelists yeah you're awesome visible yeah okay that's great so let's go ahead uh so as i said today we are going to see the different different types of clustering we will see two dimensional clustering as well we will also see the three dimensional clustering and this uh data set and the code will be available to you guys i'm not sure lokesh how you guys going to share the uh, code and the data with uh, like with the audience i can share it with you uh, we will mail them 
Okay, I will email you the data set and yeah. I will also email you the code. You can share it with all the participants. Yeah. Okay. Or we can provide in a uh, YouTube uh, section. Yeah, you can provide them. Yeah, inside the YouTube section, you can yeah. write or give the link to them about the data and the yeah. uh, code as well. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, uh, today we will do the hands-on session on the clustering. We will see two-dimensional clustering and we will also see the three-dimensional clustering. It is going to be very interesting. I know we are going to go beyond time a little bit, but believe me, at the end of this session, you are going to have a very good information about the clustering. So as we know, we are talking about different types of clustering. We are talking about two, but today we are going to talk about K-means clustering, okay? And for that, let's make sure that we have all the libraries available. I am pre-assuming that you have some knowledge of Python before attending this session. So I will skip. I won't go into very minute or each line-by-line uh, -line information of the code, but if you have any questions, don't feel uh, like please feel free to ask me and don't shy away or don't feel that okay it is not answerable or something like that i'll be able to answer you so before we go ahead the first thing we will do here is we will make sure we have all our libraries enabled we will import all the libraries we, we, are, we are talking about pandas numpy matplotlib seaborn so you can see that i'm making use of both matplotlib and seaborn and plotly as well because sometimes I use two-dimensional, sometimes I make use of three-dimensional. So I usually prefer creating different types of plots using different libraries that gives me more flexibility. So you guys can also do that. I'm going to use scikit-learn, basically the sklearn uh, for creating this machine learning algorithm. And again, for importing the metrics from the sklearn itself. The data is about the mall mall customer data, you're going to get it. First, you check the head. What does the head means? It gives you the information about the top five rows in your data, okay? And if you know, the indexing in Python starts with zero. So we have first row, which is zero row, first, second, third, and fourth, which is in total five rows. The first column is customer ID, never useful, ignore it. The second uh, column is the gender, which is male or female. The third column is very important, the age group. And the, we will see in the summary section, what is the various age groups that we have. We will also see the different annual income of the people. I have kept it, uh, kept it in the dollar because I know the people are joining from the different region. So for everybody keeping the dollar as an uh, standard. So annual income in the standard, it may be 15, it may be 16, it may be 35. Some might be having the annual income as in 100k as well. Then the spending score, uh, spending score is basically some score that has been calculated based on the spending habit of the person. For example, if I spend a lot on every day, I'm, I'm buying uh, something, maybe I'm, I'm spending in a restaurant, or I'm spending on buying some shoes or something like that but i am spending every day something so my spending score would be very much close to 100 and if i'm a very low spender i i go once in a once or twice in a month in a restaurant or i just do the shopping once or twice in a month my score will be very much low or close to one okay so the score goes from one till 100 i hope you got the understanding of the data one two three four five columns each columns like uh, some of them are gender, age, annual income, and spending score, okay? Now talking about the first thing as a data scientist you do, okay, or as a data analyst or as a data enthusiast person is to spend some time with, uh, with the data. I have listed some of the techniques. This is not all the techniques. There are many techniques to know your data, but I have listed some standard techniques for you to know what are the various uh, steps to do. The first step is to check whether you have any null values. Null value means the data is blank, there is an NA, or you don't know what the value for that particular section. For example, if there is no data here, you know that the, the customer ID is four, she is a female, but you don't know what is, what is her annual income, but you know the spending habit is 77, okay? So whenever there is a NA, whenever there is a blank, that becomes your null data. So the first step is to check how many null data you have. I have used the is.na function and I am applying sum on that just to check how many NAs I am having. As you can see, I have zero NA 
in all my columns. There is no any. Then I'm describing the data using data.describe. This is very useful function that helps you to get the description of your data. So you can see, as I say, ignore the customer ID, ignore the customer ID. But one important thing here to see is we have total 200 rows of data. The total maximum count goes till 200. Okay, this shows you the count. Now age, this shows, the describe shows all the statistical importance of that particular column. We can see the minimum age in the above data is 18. The maximum age in the above data is 70. The We can also see the mean or the, uh, the what I say, the middle age somewhere is around 36. The minimum income in our data set is somewhere around 15, 15K uh, dollar. The maximum income is going three till 137K dollar. And the medium range is somewhere around 61K. Similarly, the spending habit, for some people, the spending habit is 99. That means if they are earning 100K dollar, they are spending 99K dollar out of that every year. And they are just having the saving of 1%. And for some people, the, sp uh, the spending score is 1. Like if they are earning 100K, they are just spending 1K. Very lucky people, I don't know who they are, but yeah, good to have them in our data. Now we will check the distribution of the variables, okay? So for us, the important variable is age, annual income, and the spending score. I have plotted the distribution of them with the help of this three, like the age, the annual income, and the spending score. I'm using Plotly to plot this. And I'm checking the data distribution of age, data distribution of annual income and data distribution of spending habit. You can see that this is very uh, properly distributed. It is giving you somewhere the, the mean or I would say the middle of your distribution is somewhere here around 34, 35, something like that. Let's check what is the mean, like middle one for your age is 36. Yep. So we are having somewhere here 36. Similarly for distribution, it shows that the like the medium annual income for this entire data set is somewhere around uh, 60 or 65 somewhere here and the for score as well the the middle spending habit is somewhere around 50 okay now we will immediately start with clustering okay now we are working on the k means clustering based on the age and annual income okay two variables age and annual income. We will create the clusters based on that, two-dimensional clustering. And first of all, let's see the scatter plot between the age and the annual income. So this is on the y-axis, you have your annual income. On the x-axis, you have age. And you can see that the data is very densely populated or it is, it is not giving you any direction, whether it is giving, going up, whether it is going down, nothing. Scatter plot usually shows like when the age goes up, the annual income goes down, something like that, but it is very proper. But it is based on, if you see, I have kept the size as an age. So age is a factor over here. The smaller the circle, the smaller the age. Here, if you see, the age is 18, annual income is 48. Interestingly, when the age increases, then also the annual, in uh, annual income is decreasing. Like you can see the age is 67, but the annual income is 19. If you see, Somewhere between 30s and 40s, when the age is close to 32, the annual income is the highest, which is 137. As you grow old, your income also is going down. This is what this data is suggesting, not actually the case in reality. Okay. Then, as I said, the first step is to decide the number of clusters. And in order to define how many number of clusters you are going to have, we talked about two method, if you remember. We talked here about two methods, the elbow method and the Silhout analysis. We will see both of them. The first one is elbow method. You are defining the range and you are iterating with the for loop that the total number of clusters that you are going to have, it will depend upon the number of clusters that you are going to define and what elbow method is going to show me. So elbow method is, if you see over here, it should be like this, like the curve which is having. So the curve is coming somewhere here. 
four or five somewhere here let's consider it as a four as per the elbow method but not very much clear so let's do one thing let's also plot the sillhout analysis like this one here if you see the the maximum number which shows that shows the best uh, number of clusters or the that that is the number of clusters we can consider so this is the code for the sillhout score and it is showing me the four so my elbow method also shows the four my sillhout analysis also shows the maximum number is four. Now we are sure that for creating the cluster or, or the k-means clustering between age and annual income, I'm going to create, I'm going to take the initial number of clusters is four. So now I am creating my k-means algorithm with my number of clusters as four and my random state, I'm keeping it at zero right now and I'm plotting that figure. So once I run this, you get this. You can see that four clusters have been created cluster one that belongs to orange shade almost between 1.5 to 2.5 so it shows you the three every data points when you hover it shows you three information one is age where exactly its age belongs to which is already there on the x-axis the second is annual income which is on your y-axis the third is color like which cluster it belongs to so it belongs to the color zero or the first cluster which is somewhere here this belongs to cluster two, this belongs to cluster three, and this data belongs to cluster four. Now you have properly defined four clusters and each data point in each cluster are very much similar to each other. For example, if you see this age group 30, annual income 137 belonging to blue group. Even if you see this very much close to 30, which is 35, annual income very much close to 137, which is 120 over here. That is the reason they are close. But if you see this one, this is very much away from this. The age is somewhere over here is 39. The annual income is 69 and it is belonging to group this. So all of these data points are properly scattered into different segment, uh, segmentation or the clusters. Now let's see another one, which is between age and spending score. We are doing the same method, first plotting the uh elbow method and we are seeing here either four or five if you see there is some confusion let's decide with the help of silhout analysis what silhout says silhout says four okay let's go ahead with the four then and once you decide the number of four number of clusters again i'm plotting but this time i'm picking up age and i'm picking up spending score and I'm giving it with the help of age now again it's a two-dimensional plot that creates the first cluster of blue, second cluster of orange, third cluster of yellow, fourth cluster of violet, and each cluster will have their own data points. I'm going ahead and checking the another cluster, which is the annual income versus spending score. Again, it's a two-dimensional clustering, and this time as well, I'm using first elbow method to decide, okay, how many, cl how many uh, clusters should I give? Probably I will give either four or five, but I believe it should be, let's say five. And let's see which sellout analysis, what it says. Yeah, it is also saying five, okay? So I have used my number of clusters as five, random state zero. I have given annual income versus spending score. So five groups have been created properly. All these data points belongs to one group. All these data points belongs to one group, this group, this group, and again, this group, okay? Now, K-means clustering based on the age, annual income, and spending score. Now, there is a twist. We have we are checking it based on three different, what I say, variables, okay? And it is going to be a three-dimensional one. So, again, I'm going to check how many number of clusters should I have. So, here it is going like this, probably, probably four, or no, not four, either five or six. Let's see with Silhout. Silhout says six, yep. Like this, the turning point is here, six. Let's say six. And when we feed it to the machine learning algorithm as a six, random state zero, on the x-axis, x on the y-axis, you have spending score on, on the z-axis. The third axis is basically your annual income and you're deciding it size with the age of, uh, with the help of age. Now I'm just zooming it out for your information. Let's go, let's see here. If you see, this is your Y. If you see, this is your X and this is your Z plane. So this one is having the age of 60, 
uh, spending score between one to like uh, like somewhere around four there is no spending score like it is very much low annual income is 30 color is five so all this yellow belongs to one group all this violet are basically the high end or the person who are people who are earning high you can see on the annual income is very high on the x-axis they belongs to somewhere their spending score is also not very much or, or their spending score is also very much high like somewhere here we can see the spending score may be 26 or maybe 88 as well and they belong to one cluster so this is this kind of plot usually help you to see or uh, see the data into multi-dimensional or to three-dimensional seeing multiple dimensions together instead of relying on two-dimensional thing again uh like i'm just checking the head so i hope you got the gist and this was just to show you how exactly the clusters are being created that's it for today i hope that was the that gave you the understanding of how the clusters are being created using the k-means algorithm the code will be provided to you you can run it on your own the data would be there and of course uh, the deck would be also there for your consumption so you can have a look okay. yep now i'm open to the questions thank you a very powerful session indeed uh, you can share the net notebook and chat section yeah Ritesh, yeah uh, yeah and uh, before we proceed to ans uh, answer questions i would like to request the attendees to please fill fill in the poll about feedback as it help us to conduct more such sessions uh, over to hello lokesh we are not able to hear you i think uh, you're on mute am i audible now yeah now you're audible okay okay oh. before we proceed to answer questions i would like to request attendees to please fill the uh, feedback form as it will help us to conduct more such sessions I've... over to you pratesh yep okay thank you all the questions in the chat right in in q and a section okay q and a section okay yeah. let me go one by one i'll start with the first what is adjusting weights okay adjusting weights means like every machine learning algorithm uh, when I say that they are trying to, just one second, probably I can share the screen image. Yeah, adjusting weights. Let me tell you. So when I say adjusting weight, as I said, each machine learning algorithm or the computer is trying to understand the correlation between the input and the output so that it can create certain logic. So what will happen, uh, like as a machine, when I am trying to predict something, I see a particular uh, output of mine that I have given, and then I check it with the original value. For example, if a machine learning algorithm is predicting that the price of the house is uh, 100K or 120K, but the actual price is 140K. So when it is comparing it with the actual price, it will go back to again to its rules and logics it will fix its rules and logic so that it can prediction can come closer to 140. So when you are adjusting those rules and logic as a part of machine learning algorithm, you are adjusting the weights. Second is, maybe help speak clarify data mining cluster, data cluster analysis from data. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, data cluster analysis. It seems how we stole it. Just a second, I'm working on the second question, which is very big. Let me read it properly. Okay. I'll 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 read the question for everybody's understanding. May you help speak and clarify the data mining by David? Uh, cluster analysis. 
cluster analysis from the data cluster allocation unit of disk space or block and then distinguish this from a clustered file system. It seems how we store the data influences we may analyze the data. JavaScript object notation JSON is unstructured while the Excel files or SQL files are the structured. Perhaps how we frame the data for statistical reasoning. What happens is like whenever you have a structured data, you can directly import. And when you're dealing with statistical analysis, all the statistical analysis is happening based on the correlation between the variables, based on the correlation between the number of each variables. So when you have proper structured data, you are easily able to find the correlation between the two variables. When you don't have the structured data, like I'm talking about, like you talked about JSON, like we have certain logs, like we have images, you're not able to find the correlations properly unless and until you are converting them again into numbers and again into structured data. So it is always helpful to have the data in a structured form as in, in order to have a proper machine, in order to run the proper machine learning algorithm on them. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Wow, do you see, uh, do you see automatic platform to process, automatic platform to process the data? Yes, of course, I do see automatic platforms to uh, process the data. I have used a lot uh, like various various platforms and multiple algorithms in python that helps you to transform the data automatically instead of you spending a lot of your time but i have also observed that sometimes it hampers your accuracy like there are many bigger platform or you know many libraries as well auto ml libraries that helps you to do this job but sometimes it is not very much helpful so it is always recommendable to do your own uh, exploration of the data or transformation of the data on your own. How do you deploy the models? Question by Vijaya. So Vijaya, the uh, deployment of the models depend upon what kind of models you are building. Suppose you are building any model and you have deployed it, you can either deploy it with the help of uh, Django or with the help of Flask. Again, it is one part of deploying machine learning model. But just to answer your question very shortly, you can make use of Flask or Django framework in Python. Is unsupervised learning does not have any labels. Yes, you said it correctly, Kulvinder. In unsupervised learning, there is no labels for the data. What tools do we have to be certain that clusters are really adequate? So just to answer your question, George, uh, the evaluation metric for clustering algorithm can be done only with the real data. You can only validate the model with the real data unlike the other machine learning algorithms so supervised like uh, linear regression like uh, lo uh, logistic regression you have various evaluation metrics like you have your rmse square uh, uh, score you have your uh, precision recall all these scores that helps you to identify how well the model is performing but for unstructured uh, data or for unsupervised learning you will have to rely on the actuals of the data which is coming after the predictions what is the difference between the classification and clustering? So clustering is allocating the data points into one particular group where in advance you don't know what the data is all about. You don't know about your task as well. In classification, you know the task that you are going to classify the data either into good or bad or a spam, not spam, cancer, not cancer, something like that. Question by Bijoy, what is the soft clustering? used in industry yes of course i have used soft clustering i gave you the same example as well uh, like i was using it one of the sentiment analysis of the words where the where there were names of the people and i want to identify those keywords and segregate them into different clusters for example uh, a very common name john j o h n can also be written as j o n john and can also be written as j o h n so when you do try to do the hard clustering J-O-H-N will go to one group, J-O-N will go to one group. So there are two groups which is created. When you, But when you use soft clustering with the help of phonetics or with the help of fuzzy logic, J-O-H-N and J-O-N can belong to one single group. I hope that answers your question, Bijoy. The centroids are chosen at random. Yes, initially the centroids are chosen at the random. How to choose the clustering method good for which uh, if those, sorry, I didn't get your question. How to choose which clustering method good for which? 
of those data set? A very good question, I would say. So the entire method of deciding the clustering is different, okay? Uh, like, of course, is different for different, different types of use cases and again, different, different types of data. Some data are very much linearly separable. Some data are not linearly separable. So you will have to rely on experimentations by checking it with different methods to see that you are getting an adequate results at the end. Uh, for anomaly temperature of humidity data, what kind of clustering can be used? K-means can be used. I've used it on, on one of the open source European data. Yeah, if I don't know the profile of data set, how do I define the number of clusters? Yes, George, you are very much correct. That is the reason they are called as an NAV algorithm because you are forced to provide some number of clusters at the beginning. And that is the reason you have techniques like uh, elbow method, and uh, the other method which we see in order to define the number of clusters at the beginning, the Silhout method, yeah. Initially, K means randomly makes groups. Yes, K means, uh, K means create the randomly groups. You will have to remove the outliers. Once you remove the outliers, it is always, K means will suffer from, uh, uh, of course, I can understand K means will suffer from outliers. What happens is like if the if one data point is very much away, the centroid position will entirely change. So it is recommendable to remove. Do we perform outlier treatment before? Yes, we do. Calculation formula. Uh, what do you mean by n plus one is equals to one? So this is basically used in one of the very uh, common way of saying if n is equal to n plus 1 is equal to 1 means n is equal to a plus b and then again you are iterating the value on that n once again what value of k to choose if still out and elbow don't match usually you will get a, a value that still out is very much closer always to the elbow i haven't seen the uh, k uh, choose either no two dimensional is not really needed before the 3d clustering this is just for the representation the way you want to see the data I'm, I'm skipping some of the things which I, uh, uh, some of the questions which I feel that already answered. Can we infer the final details from visualization regarding the details of clusters? Of course not. As I said, inference can be done with the main data once you have it in reality. Ritesh, uh, I'm afraid that we may not be able to answer all the questions as we are already half hour beyond, the sh beyond our schedule. I, I totally understand that. Yep, I think I think what I can do, guys, just once this video is uploaded on analytics with their YouTube channel, go to that YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, put it in the comments chat. I will see on the weekends if I get time, I'll be able to answer it over there. Or you can connect with me on my social media channel, LinkedIn, over the chat, and I will be able to answer you guys. Thank you so much for joining today. That, that sounds great, uh, Pratesh. Uh, you can share the notebook and chat also yeah and please share the data yeah that's what i said uh, uh like the link which i have for the uh, like the data set and the code is not public i will make it public and share it with you uh lokesh or or neha then you can put yeah, it yeah. on the yeah. youtube link yeah okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank yeah. you thanks a lot pritesh uh on behalf no of analytics with you i would like to thank you for your time and delivering such a wonderful session it was really a power pack session i'm sure our uh, audience found it insightful and hopefully we can conduct more session uh, with you in the future for sure thank you yeah thank you pratesh thanks a lot